is the third in a series of technical briefings that we've been conducting in preparation for our symposium on the conversion of so-called dirtiest oil in the world, bitumen, to the material similar to conventional petroleum. We were to tell you how we believe the state of Nebraska can have a part in this and be a major player. We decided to open this third briefing up to selected individuals who may be involved in directly or indirectly in the future of this project. And for the benefit of the invited guests, we're going to have <laughs> Donna Bartolome, a special staffer to our CEO, make a brief introduction about Biosyn resources. This presentation will be followed by a presentation by the CEO, uh, Mr. Dale Rilio. Donna? in and give a little introduction, a brief introduction with regards to the Biosyn company. Um, on the first slide, what I want to talk about just for a few minutes is the primary business of the Biosyn. Biosyn is a development company established to construct and operate a biomass-centric feedstock agnostic integrated refinery. Um, a lot of that is centered around it takes in any available feedstock. Biosyn will use locally abundant feedstocks to produce advanced ultra-clean transportation fuels and petrochemicals. Um, the advanced ultra-clean transportation fuels will meet the um, mandates of the RFS2 standards, which is the renewal fuel standard established by the EPA, the ASA, in 2007. The biomass-centric refinery is a production of the biomass organic oils and the natural gas and the coal that feeds into the biomass organic oils and then the same crude oil and the crude oil. They all feed into the centerpiece of the bio-organic oils. The primary products that we have are split into two, an advanced ultra-clean transportation fuels and petrochemical fuels. The multifunctional military fuel under the advanced ultra clean, the diesel, the gasoline, and the reformer fuel for the fuel cells. Under the petrochemicals, we have the isoparaffins and the normal paraffins. Most refineries do not have both. We have an integrated system. Our primary business direction is going to run two simultaneous parallel business activities. The first one is going to be phase one, which is hydrofining, and that's inclusive of the feedstock, organic oils, the yields with the green fuels, and the market niche markets. That's one refinery. The second phase will be the um, ERTP, the enhanced phase, which is inclusive of the feedstock, the commoditized biomass, the yields refinery, the ready bio crude oil, and the markets, which is inclusive of the conventional and the refineries, which is two. The third phase for the integrated bio refinery is gonna be the feedstock, the refinery ready bio crude oil, the yields, the green fuels, and the chemicals. And the markets is the open market, that's phase three. Running parallel with that in the business activities is gonna be the production and marketing, which is the green fuel analogs, the supply of commercial samples, which is the multifunctional military fuels. And, and then the third one is gonna be the contract supply, the multifunctional mili military fuels. So they'll run simultaneously parallel with each other. The organizational structure will be, we'll have a board of directors, a board of advisors that runs back and forth with each other. Then we have the CEO, the director of the military fields, the director of marketing, the director of public relations, and the in-house engineer and the EPCM. The engineering procurement construction management is with the EPCM. Does anybody have any questions to this point? Okay. The next, with the management structure, we have outlined our participants. Okay. Oh no, sorry, go back on. My apologies. Previous. Previous. 
We have for the board of directors, we have Dale, um, Fred, Conrad, Pat, Process Engineering and Associates, which we have 55 chemical engineers partnering with us. And for the Triad Engineers Corp, we have detailed engineered studies, and this is regarding Canada also. And the last one goes with the EPCM. Both the last two, the Process Engineering and the Triad Engineers, they will run together with companies and it'll be in-house. Okay. Dale, was, did you have anything to add to the... Yeah, the, uh, those two companies, we, we cannot really, at this point in time when we are doing the engineering, uh, we cannot afford to hire expensive engineers. So what we do is we engage the services of third parties, like the process engineering associates, where they have 55 uh, chemical engineers and process engineers. And whenever we need their services for the engineering work, we, we uh, engage them. And then for the much bigger picture, we also engage the services of a company in Canada that's specializing in the construction of modern refineries. So that's what we do. So even if we are quote unquote small at this time because we are still in the engineering phase, we're actually dealing with a lot, a lot of big companies including process licensors like UOP and Halder Topso, which are also the companies that deal with people like Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, and so on. In other words, we're dealing with companies that are, um, <coughs> that are that are very active in the oil industry, even if we are still in this stage. So. Thank you. For the project cycle, we have the technology architecture, which is the Biosyn, which flows into the process licenses as the ULP, America, the Helder Topsoil, which is Danish, and the Axon, which is French. We have the detailed engineering, the EPCM, which is Canada, based on um, the design, they work with Dale, based on his design. We have the construction of the EPC. We have the commissioning process licensors, the EPCM and the EPC, which is a commission refinery. And we have the operations third party contractor with Biosyn, and that's a subcontractor. For the PPO, the private placement offering, and this is for the first phase, we have two sections. We have the Regulation D55, which is under the law, and the 10 to 15 million to raise to go up to the required studies, the process licenses, the pre-construction, the operations, marketing of the green fields, and the testing of the certification of multi-purpose military field. And for the 10 to 15 million, the, what we're trying to raise is without submitting to the SECC. The green fuel analogs production capabilities is we have the production capability, the marketing and distribution, and the refinery construction. Under the production piece, we have the gasoline, which is 2,000 BPD. We have the 3,000, the diesel with the 3,000 BPD, and we have the military fuel, which is the 500 GPD, and that's gallons per day. Um, for the marketing and the distribution, which is ongoing, the marketing team, the dealers, and the distribution. For the refinery, we have the sitting, the feedstock supply, and the project financing, which is ongoing. The multi-purpose military fuel development, we have the sample production capability, the initial testing, and the certification, which flows into the long-term military contract. For the sample production company, we have 500 gallons per day, which has already done and been accomplished. For the initial testing, which is the demo car that we're currently involved with, um, we have the demo car and the sample submissions to the military. That's ongoing. For the certification, we have the large volume sample production at 1,000 BPDs, and that's 42 gallons a barrel a day. We have the capability, we're working on that. And the long-term military contract is the refinery construction, and that's preliminary designing. The first exportation of the multifunctional military fuel, the destination was England, and the shipment date was February 6, 2012. The application was for the diesel fuel for engines used inside buildings, and it's multifunctional. Our fuel testing is like an electric engine. Our quantity for that was 220 gallons 
Dale, do you have anything to add to this piece of it that you want to talk today, about? Today, they received it today, okay. just today. That's important because our first shipment went to India. It's, it, it got lost. So the replacement, <laughs> it finally reached England <laughs> today. <laughs> As mentioned, we have our demo car that we are currently utilizing, <coughs> and Dale is using that car, and this is something that we are, is in functional for today. We've been, how long has we been, have we been doing this? Since, when, when did we buy the car? About what? a year ago. No, 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 no. About August. Oh, <laughs> Since August or, yeah, August this year. Ah, last year. The guy who sold it. Yeah, <laughs> he's the guy who sold the, as the car. Yeah. There, a, hold on. There's nothing that we did. There was no modification on the car. It's just using the, uh, the military fuel, which can also be used as jet fuel. It's a drop-in. It's a diesel. It's a diesel. It's a diesel. That was an introduction overview to the company. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point? You sent 220 gallons to England? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit, Dale? It, what's your question about that? Mm -hmm. Well, why only 220 gallons? It's huh? a test, uh, it's, a, it's just a test uh, application. Uh -huh. See, to prove that the military fuel can be used as diesel, and not only that, it's a, it's a special application where the diesel engine is running inside a building. See, when they were using a diesel inside a building, it makes everybody sick after a few hours. Yeah. So using this fuel, Yeah. can you hold one of those test tubes? That's why we'll pass this around later on. It's odorless, colorless, and so on. Uh, it doesn't make anybody sick. It doesn't it's smell. It's like propane. No, it's not propane. It's liquid. No, it's but it's like it's just like in yeah, the yeah, the yeah, something like clean. that. It's very yeah, clean. Burns clean. Yeah. Yeah. Some people think it's water because it doesn't smell anything, but it's it's diesel. It's but it's also non military fuel. Non-toxic. Yeah. You can drink it. How? <laughs> I you can drink it and not die. <laughs> I, I came in five minutes late, but how are you acquiring the raw materials for refinement? For I will uh, explain that later on the main. This is only an introduction. Could, oh, this, oh. could you save your question uh, later okay. on? I'm going to go into the details of this. Okay. She's just giving us an overview, overview of the company. Conducted a brief overview of the company. I think we've come to pretty much that conclusion for that part. So if anybody doesn't have any additional questions, I'm going to turn it over for the rest of the evening to Dale. Uh, no, respect. Okay. Go ahead, yeah. Sorry. Well, I get to introduce Dale. Uh, Mr. Dale Aurelio Jr. is our CEO and he's the main force and the inspiration behind Biosyn Resources. I've worked with, with Mr. Aurelio since 2001. Uh, we first worked on a project called Energy Security Initiatives and then the Omaha Clean Cities Project. Under the Energy Security Initiatives, we lobbied Congress for the large-scale <coughs> large conversion of coal to synthetic petroleum. Under the Omaha Clean Cities Project, we worked with the Department of Energy to promote the use of alternative fuels and alternative fuel vehicles. Biosyn's current project, which is the construction and the operation of the biomass-centric feedstock flexible refinery, is a continuation of what we started many years ago when we lobbied Congress for that coal conversion to synthetic fuels. Uh, Mr. Rilio is a petroleum engineer by training and his passion is to bring to market ultra-clean transportation fuels that use sustainable <coughs> and locally available feedstocks, with emphasis on the feedstocks grown from dedicated energy crops. He has a number of proprietary interest uh, industry exclusive products, one of which won the 1999 Product of the Year Award from Lubricant World. Another one of his many projects worth mentioning at this time, and Donna alluded to it, is the formation of that world's first ultra-clean, multifunctional military fuel. It can be used in various applications, from jet fuel, diesel fuel, home heating oil, and reformer fuel for fuel cells. Today, we're happy to announce that, what David said, that the first export shipment has arrived in England just a few hours ago. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rilio. 
Thank you, Pat, and uh, thank you, Donna. Before I uh, start with my uh, presentation, hopefully this is about 30 minutes, hopefully 30 to 45 minutes, and uh, after that we have a, an open forum. But let me uh, introduce you to our other associates. He's Fred Lagger Green, one of our directors, and he's an ex-colonel uh, in the Air Force, and he's the one in charge of um, uh, promoting our product to the U.S. military. We have already opened uh, the, the uh, door to the uh, U.S. Uh, Air Force regarding our military fuel. We have uh, uh, Conrad Bartholomew is our director for marketing. And right now we're also working with Mike on certain s on special um, project. Uh, hopefully we will be able to introduce Echo Green cars and vehicles using a number of our products. A bit before Professor Suzuki leaves, we thank him for, for arranging this uh, facility for us. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And of course, Pat is my uh, executive secretary, and Donna, who is helping us uh, in many small things. Anyway, um, let me proceed. This. This is a actually an internal briefing for our staff, but we decided to open this to people like you in order for us to prepare for a symposium of the same title, Clean Oil Project, the Nebraska Solution. <coughs> now, um, we put quotation on the clean oil because there, there's, there's really no such thing, clean oil, but we'll explain why we put a quotation on that as we move along. And I would like to emphasize that the state of Nebraska will have a very important role if we are successful in proceeding with this project. Actually, this particular uh, project is the fourth phase of our biorefinery. Donna explained the three phases. Actually, the fourth phase, which we project to be about four to five years from now, is actually this. Not about the Nebraska solution, but it's, it is uh, the use of bitumen, which comes from Canada, which is referred, now, referred to now as dirtiest oil in the world. So um, we're going to talk more about that as we move along. Anyway, next slide, please. Here is the bold statements we're gonna make. All right. uh, actually, the third one, but the first two, that the environmentalists have compelling arguments against the Keystone Pipeline, the construction of the Keystone Pipeline, simply because <coughs> it will move the dirtiest oil from Canada to the United States and satisfies the, the country's addiction to oil, that's their argument. Whether it's, whether it has merit or not, you can't really argue about that, especially if you see pictures like this. Can you click uh, the this oil, please? This is the way they, they convince uh, everybody that it's true, there's an open pit mining going on large scale in Canada, and it really destroys the sur a lot of surface areas in Canada and um, I forgot to bring my uh, laser, but is, you see this um, maple leaf? See, there's a lot of ad hominem uh, rendition of the way this is presented to the public. And it, it's true, it's kind of quote-unquote dirty, but I will explain what is the meaning of dirty there, okay? So they don't want, they don't want that. That's the uh, argument of the environmentalists. And the impasse, uh, that uh, we would like to to propose will be well if we can convert this dirty oil into an oil that is of acceptable level uh, cleanliness and we can do that in Nebraska. Nebraska is the ideal state in the United States to do that and it happens to be the fourth phase of our project. So we're kind of uh, advancing this in, in the light of the fact that the Keystone project 
was rejected by the U.S. government. But there are still uh, a very strong group who are trying to push for the construction of the pipeline. So we know that uh, sooner or later the pipeline will be constructed. Meanwhile, there is a there is a need for that product in the south, and there's a problem in the north because they have already invested billions of dollars in the production processes and with expectation that the pipeline will be constructed and that or those cons those uh, production facilities are not able to you know to recover their investments so so we we contend we propose that the place the ideal place for solving that impasse is in the state of Nebraska and we're going to show that to you okay Next. So basically, for the next 30 minutes or so, this is, this is what we're going to be discussing. I will uh, spend more time on the project description, of course, and then the conclusions, and then hopefully you can uh, join us during the open forum. Next. Objectives. Next. The main objective, of course, is because this is internal briefing, is for our staff to be briefed, to be up updated on what's going on. But we are opening this to our potential stakeholders and present stakeholders. And uh, we are actually taping this such that we can send a tape to possible uh, investors, but more importantly to policymakers and planners, especially in the state of Nebraska so that if they pick up the idea, then perhaps they can support us for this project. Next. Second objective is uh, to prepare us for the main symposium when we will officially invite policymakers or their staff to join us during the symposium. So this is like, a, like a, um, an introduction to that symposium. Next. Also, we would like to uh, show that Yes, we do have the capability to formulate solutions pathways to seemingly complex problems that create a lot of polar polarizing issues in the country. And we think we have the solution. Next. So to understand this and, and appreciate this better, let me share with you some background information. This relates to our company. Next. Uh, when we, uh, Donna mentioned about the idea of uh, the private placement offering, when we formulated our document on that, we were hoping, that was last year, that we would be able to apply for a loan guarantee from the government under the Farm Bill 2008, in particular the Buy Assistance Program, I'm sorry, Buy Refinery Assistance Program, where this year we were expecting that about $400 million would be made available but late last year, we found out that um, uh, a political party is, has decided to defund that. So uh, we're kind of, um, the, right now there's only a, an available fund of $65 million. But for our first phase, we need at least $120 million. And there will be others who would be applying for that as well. So uh, we thought that um, we're going to have to rethink about the our priority in terms of getting assistance from the government and go more fully to the pop, uh, private sector. Then there is the second development, which is the uh, sometime in June, uh, three government agencies, the Department of Energy, the Department of Agriculture, and the U.S. Navy decided to come to an agreement making available $510 million for companies that will help the government or those three agencies come up with jet fuel from renewable sources. And we thought that that's a very, pos uh, very positive development for us because we can apply for that as well. The only problem is that uh, they're thinking that uh, by their pronouncement, pronouncement that by 2016, half of their requirements can be, can be supplied from renewable sources. We think that there's not enough feedstock from renewable sources to meet the requirements of the U.S. Air Force and Navy for half of its um, jet fuel requirements. 
So, um, but that's a development that we would like to take advantage of. As a result of that, we decided to move ahead with the formulation of the multifunctional military fuel. And through uh, Fred, we, we opened the door for negotiating with the U.S. Air Force. It's kind of complicated, but we think we can do it. The third development is about a few days ago, or I think two weeks ago, the, uh, the government rejected the Keystone XL pipeline project, which created a lot of issues. So those are the relevant developments that led us to go into this symposium. The next. Now, what has that got to do, those developments with, with this? Well, first of all, we have the fourth phase of our refinery that we decided to use bitumen as our main raw material because it is a major, it is, it, it is abundant not only in Canada but also in the United States, although it's not yet as developed in the United States as in Canada. But the amount of the volume of bitumen in Canada can, uh, can compete against the volume of, of crude oil available from the Middle East. That's a lot of bitumen. So we're looking at that. But the, as a result, we already know how to bring that bitumen to the United States without uh, depending on the pipeline. We also know how to quote unquote clean that bitumen because we are aware that under the uh, section 526 of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, the federal government agencies are not allowed to buy any petroleum product, whether gasoline, jet fuel, or diesel, from, from uh, companies that use feedstocks with carbon footprint higher than conventional oil. Bitumen definitely will be disqualified right away. But bitumen is such a, an attractive feedstock because of its sheer volume and it's available in Canada. So we already know how to figure that out. We know how to um, address that uh, carbon footprint uh, requirement by the, the federal government, okay? So that's the background, next. So what is this bitumen? It's referred to as the dirtiest oil, okay? That's a uh, picture of bitumen, it's like molasses, it's very thick. Uh, or viscous. Well, the meaning of dirty is not really, there's no such thing as clean oil, whether it's conventional oil that we buy from Saudi Arabia or bitumen. It's, in fact, both raw materials can be turned into something like this. And when you, exactly the same chemicals, whether it's bitumen or conventional oil. And so when you burn this, and if you made if you use bitumen to burn this, I mean to, to make use, to produce this and then burn it, it will be clean. But why is it that bitumen is dirty? Well, the definition of dirty is that the production, the extraction, and the post-extraction of bitumen, the processing, transportation, refining, and consumption, uh, is very, very carbon intensive. To give you an idea, in Saudi Arabia, to drill a hole in the ground and extract oil, it costs about two to three dollars per barrel. And that oil can be pumped into the ship, waiting ship, and then transported around the world. Now, that two dollars or three dollars is, is actually a, a, the cost of, of extracting that oil. And that cost is actually the fuel, which is, which is producing carbon or carbon dioxide. So think of this, it's, it costs about $2 worth of carbon dioxide to produce that oil in Saudi Arabia. In contrast, bitumen, you need to extract that bitumen which is underground. It, it takes around four to six months to hit that layer of... Trying to, make, trying to get a rock. Side, oh, yeah, side yeah. four foot rock. Yep, yeah, that's what Courtney George is tapping. <laughs> so 
<laughs> they don't want me to. Um, <laughs> it takes around four to six months to hit the, the layer of bitumen underground. Four to six months. They do this by introducing steam. And steam is hot, <coughs> you know, hot water. That's that's um, it takes about it takes a lot of energy to, to, to create the steam to heat the bitumen underground. And then after that, you have to clean it up like that. So that's the, the extraction. Now, I use the word or phrase post-extraction because in Canada, there's also what you call open pit mining. And like any other mining, there is what you call tailings afterwards. So you have to address that, you know, the tailings. It's, it's, and it's very, very expensive, okay? So the, right now, the, the cost of just the extraction and the processing of bitumen is roughly about $50, roughly. Now compare that to the oil in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. So that's $50 worth of carbon dioxide. That's why it's called dirty. It doesn't make the, the oil from Saudi Arabia clean, but that's just the definition of it. Now, when you refine, you also produce carbon dioxide, and when you consume, you burn this in your engine, it turns into carbon dioxide and water and carbon dioxide. That's why carbon dioxide, uh, I mean, this is so carbon intensive, meaning it, it produces a lot of carbon, right from the extraction down to the consumption, okay? On top of that, it has a very high carbon content. Look at that, it's, it's black. Now, in nature, if that carbon if you put hydrogen in the carbon, it will turn like this. For every one carbon, you put four hydrogen. That's actually methane, that's natural gas. But uh, if you saturate all this carbon there, it will become like this. And it's, it's kind of quote unquote clean. But if you burn this, it will still produce carbon dioxide, that's why it's dirty, okay? Next, so that's bitumen, next. Now, hydrogen is the cleanest, in contrast, the cleanest fuel. When you burn hydrogen, meaning you react it with oxygen, it produces energy, and the byproduct is water that we drink. So it's clean, okay? The problem is, you still have to produce hydrogen as well. And when you produce hydrogen, you also use energy. And when you use energy, you create carbon dioxide. Except when you use uh, nuclear power, then you produce what you call carbon neutral uh, hydrogen. But hydrogen, in contrast, is the cleanest fuel, and bitumen is the dirtiest fuel. And the conventional oil, the one that we import from Saudi Arabia, or Iraq, or Libya, or Nigeria, these are what you call, quote unquote, clean oil, but it's still dirty. It's in the middle. Okay, so that's how it is. Next. So that's your carbon, your conventional petroleum. It's not as thick as bitumen. So in fact, it, uh, it's easy to spill, like like what the picture depicts. But it is acceptable under the law, Energy Independent Security Act of 2007 by the United States. Meaning, if you produce fuels from that kind of oil, then the federal government agencies are allowed to buy those fuels. Next. So you compare. See, the, this is the dirtiest, that's the cleanest, and your conventional is acceptable. But I just would like to emphasize, though, that if that this hydrocarbon fuel Okay, you can produce this from that, you can produce this from that, or that. But if you produce it from bitumen, it's uh, the federal government cannot buy uh, from you. Now the reason why I'm emphasizing the federal government is because the federal government is the biggest 
uh, user of petroleum products in the United States as a single ent entity. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Air Force is the largest um, buyer of, of jet fuel and diesel in the United States. The Union Pacific is the second um, uh, user of diesel after uh, U.S. military. Okay, next. So, here are the, the, the arguments of the proponents and the opponents of the Keystone. If we import bitumen from Canada, it will help ensure the country's energy independence. That's what they say. It will create jobs that we need, especially now. But the opponents say, no, you cannot do that because it's dirty and you just feed on America's addiction to oil. And we have a lot of sensitive um, environmental areas or areas that are that will be exposed to danger because of the pipeline, and that's actually a very big uh, issue here in Nebraska because we have a sensitive aquifer here. Okay, so our idea is to accept both arguments and propose a solution that would address both opponents and the proponents, make them both happy. Okay. Now, before I proceed, however, from here on, please uh, watch what I'm saying because it's kind of audacious to say that. Who are we? That's the reason why during the symposium, the main symposium, we are actually inviting at least five uh, experts to be a member of our reaction panel to make sure that, especially in the technical information that I will be presenting, our, the technical information are correct and that I'm just pulling, not putting the legs of the, the audience, okay? So from here on, please think you know, in terms of the argument. Can we really do it? Does it make sense? Is it possible? And of course, please ask during the open forum. But if you want to ask questions right away, please feel free to do so. Okay, okay here's the project description. How do we intend to do that? Go ahead. We have two major components. Of course, the first one is the refinery, and the other one would be the logistics, the transportation. The refinery, we call it complex, that's the word, or the term used in the industry. Uh, we're gonna be using advanced hydro, hydrogenation technologies. Now, these are not our technologies. These are the technologies of major players in the oil industry. In other words, these, these are existing technologies. During the um, main symposium, we will have experts who will confirm what those technologies are. But these are not our technologies, but they are existing, commercially available. The first one, mainly, is, oh no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the other technology is what you call methane reforming. In other words, we will, we will create hydrogen with low carbon intensity coming from methane or natural gas, okay? Remember that, that, because that's important. The next one is carbon neutral hydrogen. And we will be using carbon neutral electricity. And that's also important for Nebraska, which I'll point out in a short while. The third one is bio oil production. This will be the, 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 the source of carbon negative hydrogen, okay? Now, we have all those that will be uh, produced in the, bio, in the inter integrated refinery complex. Then we will have the feedstock coming from Canada. And as I said, because we plan for this already without thinking of the Keystone pipeline, <coughs> uh, we know how to bring this in. That's why we have what, what we call bitumen on rail program. Now, if you heard something about something similar like oil on rail program, this is actually different from theirs. They're just, you see, moving petroleum by rail is about four to six times more expensive than moving the same product through the pipeline. Because the pipeline now has been rejected, so companies like BNSF are happy because now they can move the same product using the rail, but at a high price. When we conceived of bitumen and rail program, it was meant to compete against the pipeline. 
meaning we can move bitumen at more or less the same price as when it is moved using pipeline. That's our bitumen rail program, okay? Because if we don't have that, even if we have the refinery complex that can turn bitumen into quote unquote clean oil, but we cannot move it, there's no use. That's why you have to marry the two together. Okay, next. Now, here are the things that are kind of interesting about the project. As we, as we said, it will address both arguments of the contending parties, the opponents and the proponents. And if implemented successfully, Nebraska will become the star. That's why I use the picture there. It will be a touchdown for Nebraska. Okay, so I'd like you to think about <laughs> Because if not, you know, uh, uh, we will be making a lot of audacious, quote unquote, statements, statements here, okay? But if successful, it will be a touchdown, right, for Nebraska. Going back, um, see, if we marry hydrogen, which is the cleanest fuel, with bitumen, which is the dirtiest oil, using commercially available technologies, we'll come up with a conventional oil, not even this one yet, just the conventional oil, in terms of carbon intensity, using hydrogen, which could be ideally produced in Nebraska. Those hydrogen, the low carbon hydrogen, the carbon neutral hydrogen, and the carbon negative hydrogen, which are all uh, available cheaply in Nebraska, okay? So think about that, how? How is it available cheaply in Nebraska? Right. Now, I put the maps and the flags of both the United States and Canada. See, the United States has plenty of hydrogen. Canada has plenty of bitumen. If you marry the two, we come up with conventional oil, which will be acceptable to the U.S. government. See, one of the biggest sources of hydrogen, as I mentioned, is natural gas, which is, which is what you call, hydrogen from natural gas will be a low carbon natural gas, low carbon, okay? And, hydro, and natural gas, I don't know if you notice that natural gas these days are so cheap. Okay, let me emphasize that. In terms of the cost of energy, if, if, 1 million BTU of, of energy from diesel costs right now about $30. $30 per million BTU. You know how much it is, it is for natural gas? Pennies. $2.50. So let's say $3 to make it easier for it to compute. $30 per million BTU for diesel and $3 for natural gas, that's 10%. <coughs> so most people don't realize that there is such a big m m window of opportunity. It, do you know that you can convert natural gas into something like this? You can, we can. That's one of our other projects, but we're, we're not going to that. What I'm just trying to say is you can convert natural gas, which is gas, into liquid, like diesel or gasoline. The cost of conversion is, is so much, and you still have a lot of margin. But our, our emphasis right now is to convert that natural gas into low carbon hydrogen, okay? Use that to uh, marry that with bitumen, and you will end up with a conventional oil. And from conventional oil, you can produce gasoline, diesel, and other transportation fuels. Okay, so that's the idea. Next. From conventional oil, now remember, think about this. We can do this in Nebraska. In fact, we should be doing it in Nebraska because there's no other state that can do it as well as Nebraska. So just the refinery alone will create a lot of high paying, permanent, long-term jobs. 
that's the bio refin that, uh, refinery alone. But from there, we can produce from conventional oil that was produced from hydrogen and bitumen, you can produce ultra clean fuels, again, like this. Gasoline, diesel, and so on. Then you can produce petrochemicals. Then you can produce lots of other products, derivative products, adhesive, paints, fertilizers, cosmetics, and so on and so forth. Imagine the kind of industries and sub-industries that can be created right here in Nebraska because we have access to low carbon hydrogen, carbon neutral hydrogen, and carbon negative hydrogen. Those three in combination, you blend that with, with carbon intensive bitumen. See, the, the amount of carbon in bitumen is this, but the hydrogen that we will use here is, is negative, neutral, or low carbon. I'm talking here qualitatively, okay? When we have our main symposium, we will have our engineers to, to give you quantitative computations about that. When you marry this low carbon or carbon neutral or carbon negative hydrogen with high carbon bitumen, you come up with conventional oil, then you can produce from which you can produce ultra clean fuels and other products. <coughs> Imagine the amount of jobs and the quality of jobs that can be that can be created right here in Omaha. And I'll go a little bit more into that in a short while. Next. The low carbon hydrogen, as I said, we have plenty of natural gas. By the way, can I just emphasize what natural gas is all about? Why I'm saying why I'm kind of excited about natural gas? and why natural gas prices have come down, okay? It has been long known in the United States that uh, the United States has been blessed with a lot of gas shale formation. But the technology, you see, the natural gas is embedded in the, in the rock called shale. And <coughs> it was only lately that the technology was quote unquote Commercialized. I wouldn't want to use the word perfect, okay? Uh, almost near perfected to extract that natural gas from the rocks, okay? You probably heard the word fracking. I'm not referring to an old fracking where, where uh, Holly Borton had to get some kind of uh, exemption from Congress so that the government doesn't, or the EPA doesn't have to monitor what they're doing. But the advanced technologies particularly what they call now fast fracking, can actually um, safely extract natural gas from the formation of shale underground. And that's the reason why today we have plenty of natural gas to the point that natural gas went down from a high of about 10, then it went down to about six for a long time, and then now it's around $2.33 or 250. And it's projected that this price will, will, be, will be on that level for a long time. So we have plenty of natural gas, but it's gas. And the, the uh, common usage of that is for heating, for heating households. But there's also a technology like what we're pr proposing today that we can use natural gas as a source of low carbon hydrogen to marry that with bitumen so that bitumen can be converted into conventional oil with respect to its carbon footprint. But we can also, um, but that's for the entire United States. In particular, Nebraska has, can supply um, carbon neutral electricity and we can use that carbon neutral electricity to produce carbon neutral hydrogen. For those of you who remember your, your electrolysis in high school, you know, in a glass, I'm simplifying, it's oversimplifying. You put two electrodes in a glass of water and then connect that to a battery and you will have hydrogen and oxygen liber being liberated from <coughs> your water. That's your hydrogen and oxygen. You need electricity for that. But if you get your electricity from nuclear plant, then you will have a carbon neutral electricity. 
Nebraska already has a license for another nuclear plant. <coughs> Most people don't know that, but they already have a license. Now, add to that the fact that Nebraska has the one of the lowest, if not the lowest, electricity rates in the country. So that's an opportunity in Nebraska. Then, and I'm gonna go into some more details of that, on this carbon negative hydrogen. Nebraska is in the crossroads of many states that can produce bio crude. Bio crude coming from biomass, which comes from dedicated energy crops. And Nebraska is in the center of that. So we can, we can get a lot of bio crude from several states, process them in Nebraska, and use the bio crude as a source of carbon negative hydrogen. Next. So this is the uh, bio crude. It will be the primary source of carbon negative hydrogen. We can also supply that to Canada and use that as fuel to produce steam for the production of bitumen. So instead of using petroleum to create steam in Canada, they produce, they use bio crude. And that would reduce the carbon intensity of bitumen in, the, in, in its extraction process. Bio crude, the technology for producing bio crude is pyrolysis. It's commercially established, it's available. There's no magic with it. And the production of that comes from companies that will provide guarantees. And because there are guarantees, then it's easily project financiable. Do you follow the logic there? So that's bio crude. We have access. Nebraska is in a strategic location to have access to bio crude oil. Next. And this is how we foresee this. We have a central refinery complex in Nebraska, and we have different bio crude processing plants in, in different states, like Montana or South Dakota, Iowa, and so on. Produce this bio crude and rail them to Nebraska. And that's our raw material for the production of, among others, production of carbon negative hydrogen. And Nebraska is so ideally located for that. Nebraska also is in the crossroads, hold on, 